Um, so we're now going to shift and talk about China. Um, and I think the comment was made earlier uh, that China has gone farther than Brazil. And, uh, uh, and, and so I think we'll, we'll hear whether that's the case. My own sense is that you know, China has technologically uh, very advanced in many areas, but, and there are pieces of a regulatory framework uh, but, you know, IoT continues to evolve, as we have heard earlier. So what I heard coming out of the Brazilian um, experts is that there's an effort to create some kind of comprehensive framework around a current perception of what IoT is. And, uh, and I'm very curious as we go into this discussion I think we'll see some very advanced use cases. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, some very important uh, priorities articulated in in the national plan. Uh, I don't know if we'll see uh, a kind of comprehensive uh, regulatory frameworks, but maybe we will. That's the question. Uh, one of the questions I have as we go uh, go into this discussion. We have two people just who are extraordinarily expert, who are able to uh, uh, speak with us today. Um, you've already uh, been introduced to Professor Benjamin uh, Koo, so I won't reiterate uh, what you heard earlier, except just to note that um, in addition to his work at the I Center, he really is thinking and writing um, about knowledge management uh, in general, and this is one uh, form it's taking. He is an engineer, as he said, an MIT trained uh, PhD, uh, as well as an industrial and mechanical uh, engineering from the University of Minnesota. So he's been driving change, uh, 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 you know, from a technologist perspective. And we're also really fortunate to have with us Jonathan uh, Wurzel, senior partner of McKinsey and a director of the McKinsey Global Institute uh, in China. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jonathan Wurzel now for uh, quite a few years, and I know that he really has been um, instrumental uh, key person in building McKinsey's China office and, and operations. Um, he works, of course, with uh, numerous Chinese, other Asian, and um, foreign firms um, uh, in China, and he's also uh, played a very catalytic role um, around um, cities uh, in China. Um, he leads what's now called McKinsey's Cities Special Initiative, working with cities and regions um, really all over the world. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, Jonathan uh, deserves special recognition for um, working with so many Chinese cities and developing collaborations with research centers, including Columbia University and local institutions, and coming up with ideas that would have transformative impact uh, in cities, and then rolling those out and doing test cases. So very extraordinary. He's written five books on China. Uh, that is remarkable. At, at Columbia, we consider that very productive. Uh, <laughs> And uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with a very, uh, that have done extremely, extremely well, um, his books. And, and he's also um, part of a director of the McKinsey Global Institute, which is, as we know, a very important um, think tank um, that is producing really cutting edge research um, on fundamental global issues facing the world. So I think, um, I'm looking for Professor Ku, who I'm wondering if he has stepped out uh, for uh, a moment. Um, but uh, 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 with that, uh, let me invite uh, 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 Jonathan to get us started. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, wonderful meeting, Dean General. I mean, really, very, very good to have this kind of an exchange. Um, it sort of puts, uh, puts real meaning to the whole South-South uh, cooperation kind of idea uh, and shows that it is actually a global collaboration. So, I mean, I'm really appreciative of the chance to be here uh, and to introduce our, a few views from MGI. Um, the, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, four, four, four comments. Um, basically, just to give a few facts around China, 
and it's the digital economy. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of hype. We'll, we'll, we'll just give a few facts. Then Chinese regulation and what its, uh, what its role has been, and I would argue that it's a relatively light touch, some people might say late touch uh, approach to it all. Um, but uh, you know, there, there, there certainly are areas where it's been heavier than others. Uh, I think importantly, the future is likely to be somewhat different because the pace and the scale and the implications of the disruption uh, of IoT and more broadly of uh, AI are going to be that much bigger for business and society and as a result may require some speedier responses. The, the Chinese government has not been slow in the cases of things that it views as destabilizing, um, notably the ban on, on ICOs, for example. Um, so. Um, and finally, I think that there are some opportunities for collaboration. I'd be interested to have that conversation here and to see whether we could walk away with a few ideas uh, for, for, for us to work together, for China and Brazil to work together. So, um, but without any doubt, I wanted to start with this because, I mean, it's my one economist chart, and I have to confess I am not an economist, but uh, uh, I, I will say that, you know, this is, this is actually drawn from uh, Li Keqiang and, and, and Xi Jinping's speeches, that the, those two uh, are, for my money, the only politicians that I know of in the global stage who use the words total factor productivity in their speeches. Um, so they don't need to be educated about that. Uh, and I think that it's actually quite true of uh, the broader ranks of the Chinese government. They kind of get the point that if China is going to get rich, it has to get productive or get smart. There are not going to be any more new Chinese. They're done. Uh, China passed its Lewis turning point a couple of years ago. The working age population is flat to declining. If China is going to be rich, every average Chinese has to be more productive. Uh, as a result, this is underlying the entire way of thinking about technology and innovation, that this is a critical national security goal, that uh, either China achieves productivity comparable to or greater than global leadership, uh, or it's not going to achieve the historic mission of national rejuvenation, uh, which is the way Xi Jinping would put it, uh, about returning China to its rightful place as the central kingdom, which is, in other words, the biggest economy in the world with the most technology and the most resources and the most opportunity. Uh, so to achieve this goal, um, China essentially has to see, you know, because fixed capital inputs are declining, as savings rate gradually decline, uh, and as I-Core goes up, um, therefore you get much less bang for your buck uh, from, the, from the fixed capital line, therefore productivity becomes the difference. And actually 40 or 50 percent of GDP growth of productivity is a relatively conservative target. As we think about global GDP growth, that number in OECD countries typically closer to 60 or 70. Uh, and finally, if we want to believe how are we going to get all that productivity, 60 or 70 of that's going to come out of AI. Uh, so that it's just, it's, there isn't going to be, there is some residual long tail industry consolidation opportunities for China. Certainly management is poor in a lot of places. But as we think about how those problems are going to be resolved, how is China going to become more energy efficient? How is China become more productive in its workforce? It's going to be through the deployment of digital technologies. So this is a critical national security goal, and that's my one, my one, uh, my one uh, Chinese economist uh, chart. Um, so with that, yay! You know, China's digital economy. What an awesome thing! Uh, you know, so China went from zero percent retail e-commerce to forty percent of the world's world's, world's e-commerce transaction value, and it's the largest e-commerce market in the world. Eleven times the mobile payments of the United States, and one third of the global unicorns companies with a market value of over a billion dollars. Um, and the tech is there. So you know, China's payment systems are you know, four to five times at this point faster than US payment systems. China has the world record in computing power. Uh, in order to achieve, to deal with problems of scale, China's had to evolve technological solutions to address those things. So it's, you know, it's real tech in a real marketplace. Uh, and, there, and it's not just BAT. Uh, BAT, of course, is big, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, but you know, here are landscape 50 plus China unicorns. Uh, so it's, it's a very broad panoply of, uh, of companies. Um, and this is how you get used. So Chinese payments. Um, so in the United States, if you want to bring your small and medium-sized shop online, you have to go out and buy an NFC reader or something like that, and you have to hook up. It costs you maybe 500, 600 bucks. Uh, in China, you take a piece of paper, you print out a QR code, and you stick it on the window. Uh, you are now digitally enabled. Because uh, WeChat is instant, it's free, it's micro. So you see street beggars on the side there. The guy has a QR code so you can scan it and give him money. <laughs> uh, doormen at hotel rooms will we'll show a QR code on the back of their, on the back of their hand in case you want to you know, scan them and give them money. So it's, and I don't know why people in OECD countries like to pay 3% transaction costs, you know, but okay, you know, up to you. <laughs> uh, in China, it's, it's zero. 
uh, and it's instantaneous and it's so and, and it's 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 a micro. So that's one application. Uh, this is Hama. This is Alibaba's new retail. Um, it says if the, what their whole point. The government came to Alibaba and said, "Hey, you guys, you know, you say you're doing all this great stuff for the retail segment, but every time you open up a little bit more to the uh, of, to retail, we bankrupt another bunch of so supermarkets. So how are you going to? How many jobs are you actually really creating?" So they went back and they rethought the idea and said, okay, we're not about, we're not about direct to consumer, which would be JD, uh, we're about enabling the retailer. So every, we're bringing the retailer online to cloud service. So here we create this model where anybody who is a small retailer can join our platform. We want the data. Uh, what they get is the ability to customize the experience to anybody within a half kilometer radius of the, of the supermarket, uh, proven to boost revenues by 30 or 40 percent for any shop that participates. Uh, you get online deliver, online order ordering uh, uh, offline delivery. This guy is sort of scanning from the online order into that little bag. It goes up to the top. It ships around to a motorcycle, goes out to the, goes out to the, the, home, the customer at home. And then you get to, of course, customize the assortment. So you reduce a lot of your waste and inventory. Costs go down. Revenues go up. It really works. That's why this stuff is out there. It actually works. Um, Mobike, uh, we've opened up last mile in China, so basically you have millions of people who are now, you know, scanning their QR codes and, uh, you know, riding bikes all across the city. So that basically boosted physical activity probably by about 15 or 20 percent just uh, across the population that uses the bikes. It's better, it's healthier, and again, it solves last mile between subway stations and home. Um, uh, healthcare, this is a company called uh, InfraVision, which uh, uses AI to scan for lesions. Uh, so if you're the doctor in a tertiary hospital in China at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, you've been working for 10 hours a day, you're a little bit tired, uh, the AI will help you. Uh, and it's proven to show, identify, show up 30% more of the lesions that would, not, would have been missed before, and so particularly complicated kinds of cancers. Uh, so this is, again, it's not replacing humans in this case, it's augmenting the capacity of the doctor. And finally, dealing with more mundane problems such as the toilet paper situation in the Temple of Heaven, uh, where you had multiple people coming into, uh, you know, taking all of the toilet paper. So here, the solution is because you have this massive onslaught of humanity, uh, we employ facial recognition so that uh, when uh, Mr. Joe shows up, he can, you know, put his face in the mirror and they say, "Okay, here, take, you take your toilet paper." But if you come back within 10 more minutes, no more toilet paper for you. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, it's a supply management tool. Uh, and so. And so I, yeah, and you know, of course, the problem is, what if I have diarrhea? Well, okay, fine. Then we have, we, you know, we have we have an attendant somewhere, but it does actually allow us to uh, provide a better service for more people. Uh, and that's the maybe that's the positive face of the social control. Here's the other side of it. This is when you're jaywalking in Shenzhen. Uh, this is what will flash up on the screen. It's your name, your picture, and uh, you know your you know why you're why you should be shamed shamed into uh, uh, no longer crossing the street, and possibly will be hooked to your Sesame Credit score in the future, and we'll we'll find out. But uh, you know, so that you know AI is is a you know dramatic set of technology changes, but it's also queuing into social changes and is queuing into economic changes. So it doesn't just change our tech, it changes our life. Um, I'll just close with saying, uh, yep, yeah. Recognition. They, they now recognize if you are saying the truth or lying or you are feeling a bit so Lots of stuff is coming up. I mean, people are showing up at public events and realizing that there's a warrant outstanding for them and they got picked out of a crowd of 50,000 people. <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> I didn't think that it was gonna happen. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm going to try to close off quickly, but just to say this, the second big point is that, you know, this was a fundamentally market-driven event. Nobody predicted Alibaba, nobody predicted Tencent, there wasn't anything in the plan about, you know, uh, about uh, you know, facial recognition on jaywalking. Um, so uh, there were projects, I should say that, in the, in the Golden Shield and Golden Port. So these were all proved to initiate, the government did projects to initiate, the, to show it was possible to do something. So we used to have 909 projects in China, which were basically, you know, let's China can make a semiconductor factory, or China can do biotech, or China can build a supercomputer. But there was sort of like proof of concept ideas ideas and then zoom, just let the market run with it. So this is being driven by 700 million internet users. It's being driven by all these uh, big companies. And it's being driven by a regulatory approach that essentially allows innovators room to experiment. This just says that you know it took 11 years before the Chinese government said that Alibaba was a bank. Uh, and it's mostly because the banks were starting to complain about Alibaba. They say, you know, you really should regulate them. I said, okay, fine. Um, so. Um, 
we think that you know there is space for the regulator to do more. I mean, clearly, I mean these are the five areas where we think regulatory adoption, regulatory engagement makes a lot of sense. And it's around the technology, making sure that we've got some of it, and so essentially a supply side concern. It's around interoperability and standardization of the stack so that we can work across it. Uh, clearly, there's an IP security and privacy conversation, data security and trust, and we've enabled, uh, we've talked about that. There's equally important a business culture and organization issue, sort of like how are we actually thinking about the impacts of this on unions, on workers, of course, uh, on companies as they exist today. And finally, there's a public policy issue, which is more about the, 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 the broader in, impacts on the consumer. And these are all areas where China is sort of figuring out its own way. It's been, spent a lot of time pretty much on the first topic. And so that's what Made in China 2025 is all about, essentially, is saying we, you know, so that's the Babe Ruth moment in, uh, if you use the baseball analogy, is that China is calling its shots, so, you know, going to go there. You know, it's going to be 90% Chinese sensors, 90, 30%, well, actually, I have this, um, yeah, you know, domestic market share goals for all of this stuff, which is going to be, IT, this is made in China. So, I mean, that, that's, there's been a lot of focus on how are we going to build our domestic industry, um, including, you know, specific targets around accuracy of Chinese English translation and operating costs. These are all part of MII's goals. Um, and money, money has followed, <laughs> lots of money. Um, local governments are doing this, probably more of the money has come local government than national government. Um, and then law. So I was just reading about, you know, China has, is developing its own sort of approaches to operations, data security, data storage. It's somewhat challenging to do a comparison between Chinese law and Western law because literally specifications mean different things. And so like in standard doesn't mean the same thing in Chinese as it does in English. It's more policy guidelines and uh, implementation is generally speaking left up to the administrator in charge or when you come to the, when you come to, come to the court, if you do, it's up to the court. Uh, it's much more a rule of precedent than it is a rule of law. Uh, and that reflects the fact that, you know, as of 30 years ago, China didn't have any law and have any lawyers and nothing. So, you know, this is all built on a pay-as-you-go kind of basis, which I think creates, again, a, very, a lot of flexibility and a relative light or late touch. However, a lot of uncertainty as well. So, am I doing something that's legal or not? Don't know. We'll find out. Do I want to comply? Yes. <laughs> um, so that's typically the commercial conversation. So, and I think that I will call it there um, because I'm conscious of time. Um, I'll just close with two more things. One is the, big, the future is going to be a lot more interesting in a sense, that, as the Chinese would say, so both opportunities and challenges. So we think about automation, we think China's kind of right smack in the middle of you know, who's going to get disrupted, right along with Brazil. This chart shows GDP per capita versus current work activities that are displaced by automation. So we think in a 15-year time frame, probably 15-20% of Chinese work activities will be displaced. That doesn't mean 15-20% of the jobs, that means 15-20% to of everybody's work activities. <laughs> Uh, so it's not confined to one segment of the population, it's everybody. Uh, and of course, when this happens, this happens, this tends to flip a switch. And so actually you could argue that job dislocation becomes, is actually a lot bigger than the 15 to 20% because the job changes. Uh, and you know, may or may not be good for that job. So Brazil and China, quite in the same place here in terms of its impact. You know, arguably the, the OECD will probably get hit a little bit harder and faster uh, because of the wage, uh, this essentially wage driven. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, there's going to be, if you took it absolute numbers, China will have the single largest amount of displaced workers on the planet. <laughs> uh, several hundred million people are going to have to find new jobs. You know, going look at that and say, well, they, we just did that, you know, 30 years of dislocation from farm to factory. So, okay, do it again. Uh, but no, it's actually kind of different because we're not talking about young people. We're talking about middle-aged people. We're not talking about ag to industry. We're talking about industry to digital. It's a whole new skill set. So I think this is going to be, you know, a great laboratory for learning, if you will, in a positive sense. But we're going to have to go through it. Uh, which leads me to the last point, which is essentially, I mean, government's got that role, is that, you know, we think, I do think that there is an opportunity for China and Brazil to have this conversation. Uh, that, you know, did, we see the face of globalization going forward to be a digital face. And we think uh, trade and dr global trade and goods and services has plateaued for the last couple of years. Maybe go up a little bit more, but what's exploded, which doesn't get captured, is data-driven trade. The cross-border data flows are up by trillions of dollars over the last couple of years. Bandwidth has exploded about 35 times over the last decade if you look at cross-border bandwidth. So the face of globalization now is your radiologist in Manaus uh, treating a, 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 a housewife in Shanghai. 
Uh, and so there's, you know, any, that's why Jack can go to you know, the floor of Trump, tor Trump Tower and says, I can employ a million US people on the electronic world trade platform at zero marginal cost. So why don't you want that? <laughs> Uh, so that, I mean, I think this is the challenge uh, for business, for government, for all of us to say, wow, how can we embrace this global age, digital age, and make it work for us? Uh, and this is not an academic question, if you will. I mean, there is an academic component to it, of course, uh, but there is a real world practical answer of how do we spur cross-border data flows to make them work for us, support digital investment, and enable the technologies that can ultimately turn into better health care, better retail, better mobility, for, for, and better security for, for everybody. So that would be a great conversation to have, and we're there. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was terrific. I, I had not seen uh, before a panhandler with a QR code that was really, uh, I think, symbolic of the profundity of the change. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Ku, uh, who will speak more from a technology perspective. And I think he also has some PowerPoints. Uh, so thank you for preparing those. And you're not even a McKinsey. Partner. So you see, uh, all of us uh, now use PowerPoints, even academicians. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Uh, welcome. So, uh, so this this picture actually I took me literally hours to decide whether I ought to show it to you or not, um, because the original statement was, "What would the China's IoT plan looks like?" This is China's IoT plan would look like. You know, there's only one belief system in China that we believe that human and the heaven or the physical world are united. Therefore, one person must somehow manage to basically become uh, utilizing the qi, so-called. So, so that's ultimately the IoT for Chinese. But I picked this picture. As you can tell, this guy has bigger nose, right? We, we call anybody who doesn't look Chinese are so-called the big nose people, right? This guy has bigger nose than me. As you can see, 90% uh, of people have my nose instead of that nose. And, and it turns out, uh, I want to say something that's really what we hope, because the previous session was what would China's uh, IoT plan look like. But this session is actually about design and outcome. And this actually is the design and outcome, meaning that if we were able to make Chinese culture a part of heaven and human united together, have international people or big nose people also believe and practice the same thing we do, that would be the proper design and outcome of this so-called inter internationalization of such a plan. And then today, I actually was honored to have this uh, culture shock to come back to New York. I almost come to New York every six months. And, and I lived here in US for about 16 years. But I, today, I had another dose of culture shock and also showed me that I preemptively knew I should pick this picture. I was standing there, over there, and Dean asked me, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about China's IoT plan. And Jonathan came over to me. He didn't say anything to me. He said in Chinese, are you Shanghainese? I said, how do you know? And that's pretty spooky, right? And then he started telling me all this important bureaucrat, technocrats that he knows in China. And he started speaking Chinese to me. And he actually spoke more fluent Chinese than I did. <laughs> so if you challenge him, he probably can do this Tai Chi uh, master uh, thing to you in no time. I'm, I'm serious in the following sense, that the whole idea of IoT is really not about just technology. Because ultimately, as we just saw, if the pen handler could use QR code and literally open up global account, because any of these big nose people could have paid him right, with, with real, real money, and the focus is not the technology. Technology must be so invisible that anybody can use it all the time, everywhere. And that's really China's real global plan for making it happen. OK, so now I just said the thing I may not have uh, the right to say because I am not an international policy uh, scholar. However, I do have the authority to give you this slide. I was very careful in precisely only giving you the proper information. Now, this is actually from Wikipedia. So even if it were to be wrong, it has to be precise. So all the numbers are exactly right, okay? 
So China has this uh, so-called 13th plan. And all my salary, all my uh, grants, if there were any, all came from here, right? If you do not follow this schedule, you won't get a penny, right? So, so roughly speaking, these are the key points I picked out from Wikipedia on the most important point for that one, th that one five year cycle. So let's skip 1996 to, to 2000 cycle because it's just ancient. In our days, IoT was not even properly set back then. Uh, and more important, back, that, back then I was not there in China. So the, the following five year, the 10th plan from 2001 to 2005, th there's only one and most important statement for the whole government. That is to keep the GDP up. Whether it's exactly seven or eight, it doesn't really matter. But it's basically keep the growth up so that we have basically enough uh, momentum to keep the economy and all these uh, expenses growing. I don't have the McKinsey kind of uh, uh, infographic, okay? But you see the 7%, right? Then the next five years is about smart city and urbanization. Why? Why smart city? Why urbanization? The, the whole idea is that, they, not, not, more, not only that, they actually want, as you can see, the following five years, they want urbanization to reach 51% of the entire population. Prior to this, there were literally 80%, not, not exactly this uh, uh, 2006, but there were literally 80 to 90% of people in China that were categorized as so-called farmers. In, fa in China, farmer is not necessarily a skill, a profession. It's literally, in my opinion, at least in colloquial language, and you, if you don't believe me, you can ask Jonathan. Jonathan speaks Chinese better than me. That a farmer actually implies you are different castes, you are different class of people. So by moving at least 50% of people into urbanized people, meaning you have civilized them. So now, after this 12th year plan, now we are getting into the 13th plan, it's about greener China, right? You just recently heard of President Xi Jinping wanting to have greener China that does not talk about only GDP. He even officially said that, right? So look at this roughly 10, 15 years of time the entire ideology changed. So the use of IoT technology will profoundly change because that from GDP as a number, as an abstract number, so people can report up, so we can apply for grants. Now we are actually talking about how can we make every atom in the atmosphere actually could become worthwhile for breathing, for happiness, etc. How does this transformation happen on the massive number of people within five year time plan. So let me reveal the truth, okay? Let me show my, you know, Tsinghua level of infographics. Actually, I use beautiful AI, just to tell you, okay? I, I didn't do it, I just UI AI to help me. So AI helped me create this. So this additional points on this di diagram says, in Alipay, 2004, it created digital cash services. So today, if I don't remember it wrong, is 2018, 14 years later. You know who is the dominant uh, uh, player in the marketplace? Oh, by the way, I don't own any, own any uh, stock in Tencent whatsoever, okay? It's WeChat. It's 80 to 20, according to some of the, I shouldn't say internal people, some people told me, obviously I don't know for sure, and I shouldn't know, okay? So, as you can see in this uh, diagram, when was WeChat Pay introduced? 2014, 10 years later. And 2014 was only four years ago. That actually meant within four years' time, WeChat overcome the entire Alipay infrastructure. And you know Alipay is almost as big as eBay, as Amazon, in the sense that they are the internet of everything. And then how could somebody else come in and took his lunch? And even, even uh, Jack Ma personally said the following statement. Next, physically standing next to uh, Pony Ma, uh, the CEO of Tencent, he said, maybe WeChat sh Pay shouldn't only belong to uh, Tencent. So what does that mean? 
and he himself had Alipay, how would he even bother in front of uh, uh, Aponima said, we sh you should not only solely own this entire you know, payment space. Okay, the idea is very simple. We have been tokenized. Human has become an IoT carrier. So I think let's try to make the whole thing very, very visible. Every, home, every, every, every time I go home, my, my young son, six-year-old, will very happily jump to me, oh, daddy's home. But I am smarter than that. I know what he meant. He really meant, oh, daddy's iPhone is home. <laughs> he doesn't care about me as much as he wants to play my iPhone. Obviously, the fact is that the iPhone did never really got played by him. The iPhone knows so much more about him, so the iPhone is playing him. IoT, Internet of Things technology, has become so pervasive that if you really build social app along with all these functionalities, including payment, you are completely engulfing the livelihood of the entire civilization. Okay. So now look at Bitcoin in 2008. It was an idea, and back then, and you, you must sigh after I say this, you literally can buy one Bitcoin for less than one cent. Imagine how rich you will be right now. Just do the imagination for, you, for, for now, and you'll be all happy, right? But obviously, that money did not really get to become 20,000 per coin up until last year. And it crashed again, but it's still about five, 6,000, I don't know. But still, it's easily a, let's say, a million time increase over time in 10 years. In any economy, if you had a one million time depreciation of any currency globally, you will see disaster. But we didn't. Why? Why? Recently, I have one economist says this to me. I was so deeply impressed. She said the following. She said, then I finally realized it was not the Bitcoin going up and down and changing and high volatility. Bitcoin never changed. It's the economy around us changing and Bitcoin reflects the change, right? Bitcoin has a total of fixed amount 21 million, but nobody knows how many exact US dollars are out there. Maybe you New Yorkers know, right? But I don't, I don't. And nobody knows how many Brazilian dollars are out there. Nobody knows exactly how many Chinese yen are out there. But we can all check instantaneously to know the total amount of Bitcoin that is out there. So is any other so-called cryptocurrency. And more importantly, recently, I just saw somebody was able to hack some currency so that somebody was overprinting that currency. So that is actually a news. If any other government overprinted its own currency, would that be a news? Would, that, would they tell you? So the, fo the focus is following. We are all living under a profound paradigm sh shift. We have to look at the whole world profoundly in a totally different way. So, so uh, the dean just said, so I should, I should go quick. So, so let me go quick. So I'll, I have one more minute. On the other hand, to really lift to the next generation, we need a totally different way to look at the world. We have to have a completely different cognitive foundation. That is not just about gadgets, but also about the way we think. That's why in the middle, I call this temporarily, without better words, computational thinking. But by the way, computational thinking is very Chinese. You remember back then, we invented the real random numbers, right? The Oracle. And by the way, the guy who linked uh, energy, the smallest amount of energy to um, cryptography as the way to measure the amount of computing power required to, to do mining, for example, and was cited by Satoshi Nakamoto's original paper on the second uh, uh, degree of separation. He's a Turing Award winner, Andrew Yao, who is a professor now at Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. 
So on, on top, it's not about anybody who learns to become a shaman or becomes a, a medical doctor. You have to be able to speak a language like our previous speaker was able to talk about the entire industrial structure. And then at the foundational layer, you must be able to talk about domain specific skills. And everyone, that's the point, has to learn all three things, from meso to micro to micro. And everybody must go through the same kind of curriculum. So this is my experiment for the next three years the Minister of Education asked me to do in China. So I'm trying this first to, to my own children and also to my uh, students at Tsinghua University. Oh, by the way, I don't send my, my children to school. Uh, um, obviously, I'm in school as a teacher, so I teach my students this way. And then I hope that we can use this as a gener generic framework so allow people to have a very open-minded uh, capability to do domain-specific skills and also have the ability to see things in a macroscopic way and having the computational thinking as a way to see the world differently. That's my way of seeing Internet of Everything. Thank you. Wonderful, fascinating remarks by both of you. Thank you. Please join me for a few minutes uh, before we break. So many interesting things were said, it's hard to know where to land. But you know, I guess one place I'd, I'd just like us to, to help orient us is, um, you know, Jonathan, you said that, that um, China is so committed to raising productivity that digital is a, a fundamental driver of raising productivity. So whatever is, is needed to, to achieve that, whether it's AI or other instruments, uh, and thus, by implication, uh, the uh, interconnection of things, uh, which is part of, uh, you know, which is really what I think of when I think of the Internet of Things. You know, you need the foundational features, uh, such as uh, digital, uh, but then you need uh, to use that to build that interconnected world. And interestingly, neither of you are really making a distinction uh, between um, the sort of cyber physical systems, the machine to machine, and the digital foundation. And I just wonder, is, is, is what, do you think of IoT frameworks as um, just fully integrated, or is there a distinction between the digital and the IoT universe in, in, in the China? Because neither of you made that, made that distinction. That's a, I mean, that's actually a, a really interesting question. I, I, I initially thought it was about digital versus physical, but if it's digital versus IoT or how IoT fits into digital, um, I, think, I think IoT... Um, is a component of a broader set of digital technologies. So, and I mean, we would have a quite specific definition about IoT in a sense, having at least three components to it, um, a sensor, an analytical engine, and a decision-making apparatus. And you know, those, that, that constitutes an IoT system. Um, and uh, whereas digital could be potentially broader than that and might not have a decision-making component to it, um, you know. So I think there's I think, it, I think the IoT and uh, aspect of this though um, is very much linked to the physical in the sense that it has to actually influence the physical world in some way. And mm -hmm. I think that that would be a you know a, a, a pretty uh, critical part of the definition. Um, and uh, from that point of view, I think it's you know it's an overlay on the physical world, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the, and the reality being that China today invests more in infrastructure than the United States and Western Europe combined on an annual basis, and so the growth of that physical infrastructure is just much greater, and as a result, the uh, the opportunity to introduce new intelligence into the system is that much higher. Uh, as a result, you see much quicker uh, the intelligence in, in in the actual physical thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope that's that's getting close to. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, very that. helpful. And yeah. and Ben, do you see a distinction, or do you see it in the Chinese context as a fully integrated conversation? Uh, yes, I, I would consider it as a fully integrated con uh, uh, consideration for the following reason. Um, uh, one of the key thing about IoT in general is that uh, it allows people to address anything with a short number. 
And the number is supposedly roughly 2 to the 256 power, or 256 bit, which is literally, if you write it down in hexadecimal numbers, it's a short, short string. Machine can check it really quick, and human can literally write it down, right? And that usually supposedly covers all of the atoms in the universe and multiplied by a million times. You still cannot exhaust it. And that generic idea was really a different way of seeing language, meaning that how do you con consciously relate a symbol with many, many possibility or specific devices? That idea completely changes the way we deal with everyday identifiable and uniquely addressable thing. That literally sounds like a spell, like a, how do you say, uh, uh, abracadabra, right? And literally, if you read those numbers, it will sound exactly, am I allowed to say this? <laughs> so so, so the, the, the fact is that computer is speaking that language. Because the computer is speaking a language, and unless we were able to allow see people to see this simple mathematical secret, or math mathematical mechanism that we couldn't possibly really educate people to see things differently than they were born to be trained as a regular human, because this is a part of our civilization. On the other hand, as an educator, as an IoT architect, in the only way to really see the whole world in, in, in so-called um, uh, egalitarianly, allowing anybody to see this simple idea that we must integrate this not only on the technical level, but also on the philosophical level and get them to understand it from the get-go. So, so let me move you for a moment before opening this up, and we will open it up in, into a little bit more controversial territory, um, uh, which is, you know, China has these tremendous uh, capabilities, incredibly talented people, obviously, uh, innovative firms, uh, Jonathan has emphasized light regulatory framework, a policy environment that has emphasized the importance of this area, thrown money at it, um, required data to be localized, right? Um, uh, limited uh, those who have access to that data, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, collected it, the state itself. So how much of that requires, uh, of those elements uh, sort of, I think, are, are really nationalistic in character, that do not leave space uh, for foreign market participants or technology? Or are there areas that really uh, would thrive uh, only if uh, it's an open architecture? Um, well, I, I, I think it's an ong first of all, it's really a work in progress here. Um, I was just reading the latest from CSIS, and that their, you know, their their view would be that China is evolving a data security regime which is closer to GDPRs than it is to U.S. and uh, um, and uh, you know and the APEC, or APEC, but there are it's supposed to be less rigid uh, in their view than than GDPRs and allow more room for consent, uh, sort of implied consent as opposed to explicitly given consent, and 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 so forth gets very technical. But the other point they highlight, of course, is this issue that standards in China are not the same thing as standards everywhere else. They're not actually technical standards. They're, again, more policy implementation guidelines. Uh, and guidelines is something that, you know, it's, it leaves the, the regime uh, plenty of room to say, well, maybe we didn't want to do it that way. <laughs> so we could, so it, it, uh, it, it creates all this uncertainty, which is, I think, the, the, the sticking point in all these negotiations in that, you know, we try to tie somebody down to an explicit thing, and you sort of say, well, I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to, you're not going to be able to prove the negative. You're not, not going to be able to say it's impossible for me to do that. It might at some point be possible to do it. So uh, very, uh, very, very, uh, that's, that's the source of much frustration, I think, in international consensus, in building international consensus. Um, as to the basic principle, of course, that, you know, in technology and uh, flows and data flows are good things, I think everybody gets that. Uh, in, in, in China, and I, I think they always balance that against the potential that those flows bring for instability. So the number one job for the Chinese government is to preserve the stability of the Chinese people and, and assure the continued harmonious and development of the society. That's the way they would phrase it. Um, and so, of course, you know, anything that promotes instability is going to be viewed as something to be quite 
quite cautious about. Um, and as a result, I said the ICO banning uh, earlier this year or last year was a good example of saying, okay, you know, really don't think that we should allow people to imagine that there's a sovereign credit behind Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, there isn't and there won't be. And anybody who's selling that on that basis is taking advantage of the good faith and credit of the Chinese people and we will not allow that. And so that uh, that became a very clear and fast response. So you know, I, I, I'm sure that there are opportunities for improvement in the way the Chinese government handles these things. And I think they would they would say as much so that this uh, this type of panel is happening pretty much every day at the Ministry of Information in China. And so that, you know, there are plenty of foreign experts who are coming over and providing their input. I would say a far more, far greater number of U.S. academics and politicians are in China advising the Chinese government than there are Chinese academicians and politicians advising the U.S. government. And I think perhaps both sides could learn from something from each other. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a comment? Yes. Um, when I was a PhD student here, uh, I tried to study the science of system architecting, meaning that how can you make system level decisions with technical precision or some kind of scientific approach? But it turns out that uh, it was believed this is architecting is a form of art, or making law and policy is a form of art, because there are so many layers, it requires a lot of discourse, a lot of uh, discussion. However, um, as we recently noticed on the field of so-called uh, private currency or so-called cryptocurrency, that is creating so much unique kind of approaches to address data, to address privacy, that became a technical question rather than purely an art. So source code can be written and discussed and knowing which line was wrong, therefore caused a total breakdown of that system. So it was actually considered not possible just merely 10, 20 years ago when we were computer scientists trying to solve a technical problem. So therefore, a similar thing applies to Chinese architecture, both in IoT and also in policy making. So now, for any government who cares to, about to know stability as important as uh, Jonathan just said, so he, he really is my Chinese teacher, so I should, I should learn more from him, that uh, uh, the government would love to know how and what kind of technical skill and tools is available for them so they can always tweak the knob and precisely know how to keep the system stable. But what would that be? As you know, recently we, we adjusted the notion of uh, uh, constitution, right, for different kind of policies, et cetera. And that's actually a, sh a sign that we recognize there's a constitution to be changed. And think about this. The Chinese people do not talk about Chinese constitutions all the time. Not in the past, right? Until recently, this became, oh, by the way, President Xi Jinping was a proud product of Tsinghua's law school, okay? <laughs> so, so put it simply, they are technical things to be understood. They are code to be written. And there are ways that we believe that we can eventually in incorporate precise uh, scientific discourse with proper policy, scientific policy making along with the super complex system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic uh, ideas on the table before us. I could keep going with uh, many more, but I'd like to at least collect a couple of, of questions, if I may, and then let um, our speakers offer a few thoughts. Um, we'll give the microphone to Thomas Lind, who, I must say, deserves enormous credit for organizing, uh, working on this with uh, Ronaldo uh, uh, today, and thank you. Thomas. Thank you, Dean. Um, my question is around cybersecurity. Uh, first off, thank you both for two fantastic presentations, uh, very informative. Um, but both of you touched on, on issues that, frankly, from a cybersecurity perspective, I find concerning, to say the least. Uh, I mean, Jonathan, you said, you know, in terms of China's focus on raising productivity, a lot of the focus was on cheaply manufactured devices with high connectivity that were easily measurable across different industries. And, and I assume from a from an ICT standpoint across different industries and sectors. And um, Professor Ku or Ben, you said uh, a, a wonderful line about how IoT means that the internet should be universally accessible and in a sense almost invisible in people's daily lives, which to me from a practical standpoint, again, sounds like cheap and, and universal. Um, and if China's 
policy, whether implicit or explicit, is to focus on that, then there's a, a clear clash with US policy, which is developing towards greater regulation, especially around industrial or critical infrastructure. And so I wonder, you know, A, is there an awareness of the kinds of vulnerabilities that you know, proliferate under those conditions? And B, are we therefore moving towards a kind of balkanization of the internet, which I know is a kind of hot topic phrase at the moment, but is, is genuinely frightening if that's for real. Okay, I'll, I'll take on that first. Um, I am definitely feel this threat of consumerism and commercialization that enters every single level. It is, in my opinion, put it simply and subjectively, it is bad. But knowing it is so bad, that is everywhere already. So we have to make bad into some kind of good. So specifically, the way I might think about it, and this is roughly my proposition, is instead of thinking IoT individually as an indi in individual technology, it, it actually could be reversely considered as if every device, every consumerism, as if there were some kind of Maxwell Steeman, as my colleague here, that I would love to, uh, uh, Han Feng, uh, Mr. Han Feng is here, Maxwell Steeman, a physicist, and or the so-called uh, demons or the Yao Guai, so you know what's Yao Guai, mm. that uh, the demons that actually trick you to do thing that's bad. And it is a way to test you how you can become good and you want to allocate your time and space according to the proper action. So that becomes a different way of becoming a person that tries to cleanse your soul. On the other hand, you have to have this so-called computational or physicist kind of thinking to see the universe with as minute as possible details of opportunity to become a better person. So you have to control your will not to be enticed by these bad demons. So on the other hand, if you don't have this structure, Anderson is addressing a power, this uh, computational possibilities, of course you're always going to be tricked. So that's why so-called education is so profound. And more importantly, it's really not about which uh, government gives more or less money to a particular program. Unfortunately, in my opinion, most of the program themselves are just not giving people enough condensation and proper structure to have the technical understanding of the secret of the universe. Therefore, we wasted too much time to know things that's irrelevant, so we could not see the truth. That's why. I, I'm not going to be able to scale to that level of metaphysical. <laughs> I completely buy what you're saying, um, because that's the intent of the of the culture. And I, I think it does, and Patricia was saying before, we somehow always wind up coming back to culture and values in this conversation. Um, I think the Chinese government has a fine appreciation of the vulnerabilities that are introduced by a decentralized architecture. Um, and uh, they, uh, as a result, have literally millions of people employed to police the Great Firewall. Um, this is, uh, so, you know, the uh, aspect of, you know, desiring to manage or be in part of this conversation is is clearly, uh, you know, it's still within the government's permit. They, they remit. They, 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 they want. They are part of it. But I think there's an ingoing hypothesis that the noble lie of Chinese government is the perfectibility of governance. And it's saying that uh, the the quality of a society is indicated by the quality of its governance, because the governance uh, indicates the says something about the capacity of the society to uh, to regulate itself. And uh, as a result, when things are going wrong in society, it's something that governance should be held directly to account for. And if they go really wrong then the governance has lost the mandate of heaven and will fall. Uh, and that has been how dynasties changed in China. So I think there's a, there's, an, there's a great sort of a sense of, you know, we actually have, as governance, no choice but to, A, fulfill the mandate, which is to, uh, you know, serve the people and sort of achieve greater heights of society. And if we fail to do that, then it's, it's on us. Uh, and I, that, that uh, there isn't anyone else who's going to be accountable for this. There isn't any external force for that matter. There isn't any internal force because governance is uh, in China is all about the whole of society, not about factions within society. Governance is there to represent all of it. So as a result, we will see and have seen a massive step up in security talk technology. Uh, and uh, that I, I think you will see great innovations in security. And there's a reason why facial recognition is very high on the list of the Chinese government's uh, 
uh, employment of AI, uh, and I can go on in terms of quantum and Bitcoin and all and crypto. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's uh, that's part of the deal of being in the Chinese government. So you have to you have to do that. <laughs> no more jaywalking in China no jaywalking. for me, <laughs> uh, Professor Lemus. Right. Uh, so first of all, thank you for mm. two excellent presentations. Uh, I would like to go back to the metaphysics, actually. So yeah. in the following sense, I think China has been really successful in building uh, overarching visions as well, not only uh, in terms of technology as applied, but also in science fiction by the work of Liu Cixin, and also uh, philosophically uh, by the work of Yu Kui and others. And I think they have like a very interesting points uh, in terms of how we should see the world in itself. So when I see the, the description of uh, your view of education and the role of technology, my question for you is, uh, aren't we delegating uh, to machines uh, what should be in the hands of the demons maybe? Or aren't we missing uh, the cosmos in this uh, process? What wonderful. So, so this diagram actually was literally designed to talk about it. So this focus is so-called computational thinking. In computational thinking or in computing science, there are three basic foundational metrics or measurement types. First one is time, so it takes a lot of time to calculate something. Second one is space, storage space, so you need big hard drive space. Or information accounts, right, you have many, many numbers. And the third one is called uncertainty. On the other hand, the Maxwell demons. So both three things are resources. So it turns out or using Oracle to predict something is not something non-scientific. Oracle is a way to use randomness to test something when you couldn't come up with a quick procedure. On the other hand, um, the, the notion of computational thinking not necessarily computing science, is actually knowing where, what kind of resources you have available to set up your boundary, to do things mechanically. Therefore, this so-called measurable time and space becomes your available resource to do trials and errors so that you roughly have a boundary, some machinery to do things up to some level of, uh, of so-called um, uh, satisfaction or some kind of re reliability. At the same time, you still have remaining uncertainty Then you can use randomness to check. That's where Maxwell Demons comes in. So it turns out it is a way to very systematically, as, as uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping once said, you know, touching the stones yeah. to get through the river is really meaning that you couldn't see it. Therefore, you have to use your other sensory and with lower resolution. So this is actually a very comprehensive way to look at how to go through a very sophisticated policy making process. Thank you, those are wonderful remarks. I think we're out of town, but I'd like to give Jonathan a chance to, if you have any concluding observation to offer, because I think that was a wonderful framing. No, I, I, I think that was great. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm just very happy that we have this uh, chance to, uh, this forum to have these conversations across, uh, across different cultures. And, uh, you know, I think I'm sure that we will, you know, come to opportunities to, uh, to work together. I mean, that's the other famous Chinese saying is to, you know, truth from facts, uh, sure, sure, chill, sure. So, I mean, as we go forward and we discover what's, uh, you know, what are the good things and what are the bad things about this, we will all, you know, have opportunities to collaborate and, and improve the quality of the conversation. Thank you so much. I think um, we, we, we didn't get too specific uh, in this discussion on where China and Brazil might collaborate or where the United States or where the world can collaborate with these changes uh, occurring in both China and Brazil. But somehow today I hope we'll weave that into the course of our conversation. Please join me in thanking our terrific speakers.